Good morning, everybody. The topic that we are going to discuss today is cooperation. As you all know, it's a very important pediatric problem. It's one of the major emergencies in new needs that would come. If you look at one of the statistics available in the world, where we often quote is the New England Regional Interventional Cardiac Program, it was the fourth commonest cause for cardiac surgery for catheter intervention in the first year of life translated to mean that cooptation is a major emergency in the first year of life. Quite often neonatal, but even later in infancy also, it could come to you as a problem. Cooptation is a narrowing of the aorta, anywhere from the transverse arms to the iliac bifurcation. Now that is a technical definition. 98% of the cooptations that you and me are going to see would be juxta ductal around the insertion of the ductus into the descending aorta. Now, the portion of the descending aorta between the left subclavian artery and the ductal insertion is called the isthmus of the aorta. So, the cooptation is usually isthmal. It is a slight male preponderance. If you look at this image, it gives you an idea what is cooptation. The vessel that you see is left subclavian. This is a cardiac MRI image. Distal to the left subclavian on my marker is on dismus, and you have it at cooptation. While this is a very nice image to illustrate cooptation, unfortunately, cooptation doesn't occur as an isolated obstruction in the isthmus. More often, it occurs in the arch as well. Arch hypoplasia is so common in neonatal cooperation that um, in different series, the incidence of this is upward of 80%. If you look at um, these pie charts, this shows one publication and two others with which I have been associated in two Middle East hospitals where I have worked, where to show the neonates with arch hypoplasia and co op, the dark blue is the one with hypoplasia. In the central picture, where the mean age is 41 days, it is lower. The message is the younger the baby, the more likely co optation would be associated with arch hypoplasia. An older child or an adult who comes with co optation is a freak survivor they tend to have isolated ischemic cooperation. This is what you often see. This is a CT angiogram image. Here, if you see, this is the arch. You can find that the isthmus itself is quite small and tortuous, and then there is a discrete contraductal cooptation. This is a similar image. This shows a long hypoplastic segment of the transverse arch how we label the different segments of the arch I would come to shortly. And uh, there is a discrete cooptation which is marked there. So in both these instances, the discrete cooptation is accompanied by severe hypoplasia of the proximal arch. Now, this is how we label the arch. Look at this diagram carefully. This shows the arch. You know, the arch has three branches. They nominate. It divides into the subclavian and common carotid the left common carotid and the left subclavian. The part of the distal ascending aorta, uh, is that's obvious, this is the distal ascending aorta. But what we call the transverse arch is between the innominate and the left subclavian. And the part of the transverse arch between the innominate and the left common carotid would be called the proximal transverse arch. And the part between the left common carotid and the subclavian would be called the distal transverse arch. Whereas the portion distal to the left subclavian is called the isthmus. And here is the coact itself, here is the descending aorta. Remember these terminologies which we would be using often. Now, why do we take so much trouble to define the arch in this way? Because the arch hypoplasia is a very important concept in the management of cooptation. You say that an arch is hypoplastic, you can look at several criteria. The yard with which you compare the arch is the descending aorta at the level of the diaphragm. The reason why we take like that 
the descending aorta at the level of the diaphragm is related to the body surface area. There is no postenotic dilatation there. There is nothing else happening there. It is genuinely related to the body surface area. And you can take that as a gold standard with which you relate other measurements. So if the arch is less than 50% of the descending aorta at this level, it is hypoplastic. The surgeons use the a simple rule of thumb. If the arch is less than weight plus one millimeter in a neonate or young infant, it is small. In the sense in a three kg baby, you want the arch to be four millimeter. Less than that is hypoplastic. Or you can be very scientific and use the C-scores if any arch dimension is less than the, the value is uh, less than two uh, minus two, that is uh, hypoplastic. But the truth is you are using multiple parameters to enhance accuracy. They're all different ways of expressing the same. You don't need to swear by one. After all, our purpose is to identify arch hypoplasia below fail because it's a determinant of surgical strategy. Can you go from the left thoracotomy or can you need to do a median stenotomy? A median stenotomy is a surgery on cardiopulmonary bypass. The actual technique that we use, we, I'll explain some of these techniques as we go along. And the arch hypoplasia would also determine the surgical outcome, like mortality. The one with the normal arch uh, will have practically zero mortality in any good center, and um, there would be no uh, there would be a very low chance for re-intervention. And if you are doing an intervention also, whether you're going to do a balloon or a stent or an arch stent, will be decided by the significance of arch hypoplasia. Now, moving on to a more routine problems, clinically confronting the cardiologist in the pediatrician. You have a three-day-old baby with a large PDA. How would you think of coaptation in such a baby? The problem the posterior shelf, which is so characteristic of coarctation in the echo, is difficult to see when there is a large PDA. And the continuous wave gradient that you look for across the isthmus is not reliable when there is a large PDA. In this setting, you need to have a high index of suspicion and some conclusion drawn from an eyeballing of the anatomy to suspect coarctation. What I mean is, we have already said, coarctation in the neonic is very likely to be associated with hypoplastic arch. So if you can't see the coarct itself, look for arch hypoplasia. The distal transverse arch, if you take its length and its diameter, that diameter should be more than the length. To say that the uh, distal transverse arch is adequate, the diameter should be more than the length. If it is less, if the, the distal transverse arch is then hypoplastic, and that is very likely to be associated with a coarctation in little downstream, even though you haven't seen the coarctation. Similarly, you can also, you may not see the posterior shell, but you can look at the isthmus, and if the isthmus looks small, when do you say it is small? related to the descending aorta at the level of the diaphragm. And if it's less than two-thirds the size of the descending aorta at the level of the diaphragm, there is very likely this coarctation. So in presence of PDA, see how small is the distal transverse arch in the isthmus. That gives you a clue. And of course, you keep monitoring the upper limb and lower limb uh, blood pressures, the lower limb pulses serially. That would give you the answer. Let's look at some classic presentations of coarctation, the new in it, which you are likely to see. If you see a 36 hour old infant, uh, which had gone from the nursery without any problem, but the baby has now got increasing pallor, tachypnea, and respiratory distress, and the pediatrician finds an enlarged liver, a gallop rhythm perhaps, but poor pulses in the upper extremities, absent pulses in the lower extremities, you have a classic presentation of coarctation. What has happened is a baby which was normal in 36 hours has crashed, gone into shock, and the lower limb pulses are palpable. Classic presentation of coarctation. Supposing the baby has grown into 
a few weeks or a few months. They could come with heart failure, reduced low volume pulses on your routine examination, a murmur and a brewing in the back, upper limb hypertension, and uh, clinically the baby has gone into heart failure, you think it's a cardiomyopathy, and a casual echo suggests dilated cardiomyopathy. These are also ways in which cooperation can present you. So in an infant, look at this scenario. A baby which is all right till six weeks of age, the mother says that the last few days, feeding has been poor and the breathing has been faster. And now the baby on your examination has hypotension, absent femoral pulses and metabolic acidosis in the blood gas. You have a gallop, the x-ray shows a cardiomegaly, there's a lot of um, liver enlargement and echo, like I said before, in a casual reading, has been reported as dilated cardiomyopathy. Classic presentation of severe coagulation in an young infant. How do you manage such a child? It's very important that you try to manage them before you pass the baby on to a tertiary care center. If you have access to echo, that's of course diagnostic. In the tertiary care center, quite often an echo is all the imaging that you're going to do. But sometimes we may do a CT angio or CAT, much less commonly an MRI. This is because sometimes it's not clear whether the proximal transverse arch is normal or otherwise. It's very important from the surgical point of view, and therefore an additional imaging may be required. But from your point of view, from a pediatric point of view, for a neonate in shock, you should start prostaglandin immediately, along with your other supportive measures fluids, ionotropes, ventilation if required, correct the acidosis, look at all your neonatal concerns, look at the blood sugar, calcium, and then only transfer the baby. Not that you should sit on the baby forever, but 12 to 24 hours of stabilization of a baby in shock gives a much better chance of the baby surviving, surviving the surgery compared to sending the baby in shock over a few hours of road journey to a tertiary care center. And uh, what do we do? Once we receive the baby, we stabilize over a few hours. And um, the procedure of choice in the new unit and in the first few months of life is definitely surgical. But once the baby is beyond three to six months, if it is a discrete cooperation, the transcathetic management comes into the picture. Even though, as a general statement, you could say, that in infancy, surgery is preferred over intervention. What does prostaglandin do in neonatal coaptation? It, of course, opens the ductus. If the uh, coaptation is extreme, you have seen the site where it occurs, then the ductus would supply the sitting aortic perfusion. And then, of course, your SpO2 in the feet is going to be lower. But even when the coaptation is not that tight, an open duct provides a greater lumen, lumen width opposite to the coarctation. Mind you, it is contraductal, the coarctation occurs. So when the duct is open, there is a greater diameter along which the blood can flow. Now, in a baby with coarctation, there are other things that may be there. Turner syndrome is commonly associated with coarctation, so that if you clinically think that the phenotype is a turner, do look for cooperation. A bicuspid aortic valve on auscultation as a constant detection clip in an echo where it is demonstrated as bicuspid occurs in asthmatics for 80% in many series. So you can consider it a near invariable association. And sometimes the obstruction may occur at multiple levels, not only cooptation, but in the LV outflow tract and also in the mitral valve. So when you have this combination of LV outflow obstruction, parachute mitral valve, and a coarctation, it's called a Shons complex. Mitral valve abnormality may result in mitral regurgitation. Other lesions like a VSD or a PDA are commonly found. And extracardiac uh, problems like a very aneurysm in the cerebral circulation or a polycystic kidney are also not uncommon in coarctation. And a coarctation is quite often just the tip of the iceberg. There's something far worse 
makes the baby has scoff. And this could be a large DSD, which requires management in the neonatal period, LVOT obstruction, which is severe, transposition for a DORV, BSD, uh, posterior PA that behaves like a transposition, what we call a toxic being anomaly, a single ventricle. All these can be associated with cooptation or interruption of the aorta. A hypoplastic left heart is an extreme thing that can be associated with cooptation. What is common with all these intracardiac major problems and cooptation is a proximal arch hypoplasia and a smaller ascending aorta. When you a distal transverse arch hypoplasia is so common in a unit with the even have any other anomaly and cooperation, but a proximal arch hypoplasia, which is a much bigger impact on the surgical technique, is common with these intracardiac lesions. Look at um, some of these case scenarios. I've drawn all of them my from my previous center in Muscat. A 30 week preterm presents on day nine in shock. Weight is 1.4 kg. There is severe ismail cot. I'll show you the image in a second, but the arch is okay. The baby is stabilized overnight on prostin and dinotrophs, undergoes a simple resection and end to end anastomosis, and there is a good result. I hope you can see this image. Here, there is a uh, coaptation, a decent arch with a discrete coaptation, and uh, uh, maybe it's operated. In another case, a 29-day-old baby is referred for a heart murmur. Baby is fine. Weight is 2.8 kg, and there is an upper limb hypertension. And the arch shows that the proximal arch is 3 millimeter. The weight is 2.8 kg. Distal arch is 2.7 millimeter. So there is an arch hypoplasia and coaptation. There is no cardiac lesion. This baby undergoes a resection and an extended end-to-end -end anastomosis. There is a 10 millimeter post op gradient in the proximal transverse arch. So, this is the echo of that baby. You can see the uh, in the color flow image the smooth flow picking up turbulence towards the isthmus where there is the posterior shell. So, that's a tight cooperation in this baby. Case three is where operation of the tip of the iceberg. Day 2 baby, weight 2.4 kg. This baby has a toxic being anomaly with cooperation. And look at the CT NGO of this baby. The intracardiac lesion is toxic being anomaly. The CT NGO shows that the transverse arch is sort of okay, but the actual isthmus is attritic. There is only a fibrous continuity. This baby actually underwent an arch repair by resection and extended end to end anastomosis on day two with a small residual arch gradient. The idea was to do a PA band as well, which the baby didn't tolerate. But so two weeks later, the baby underwent an arterial switch. The baby had a prolonged ventilation, but was otherwise okay. Now, these days, you quite often, as a neonatologist or a pediatrician, would be told that this baby has undergone an antenatal scan and there is a suspicion of cooperation. So, how do you suspect cooperation in the fetus? The contraductal shelf is difficult to visualize in the fetus. After all, cooperation is a progressive thing and that progression is postnatal. The, so, the presence or absence presence of a shelf, if you find it well and good, more often you wouldn't see it. The fetal diagnosis of cooperation involves appreciating how small the isthmus is and how small the transverse arch is. So certain things that happen in a fetus with cooptation, the RV looks disproportionately larger, or you could say that the LV looks disproportionately smaller. And there are ways of quantifying this. And the smallness of the arch can be quantified in the fetus by relating the isthmus to the ductal diameter. If the isthmus is less than three fourths of the ductal diameter, it is abnormal, it is small. small. And uh, a small isthmus makes the ductal, uh, the angle at which it joins the ductus rather acute. And uh, you also have C scores for the isthmus, which you can relate to the gestational age or the femur length. You can look 
look at the pulmonary artery size in relation to iota, normally it should be less than 1.6 PA by iota. More than that is a disproportionate enlargement of the PA, very suspicious of coaptation. And look at the LV mid cavity versus RV mid cavity size in the second trimester. If the LV is less than 0.6 of RV, that is suspicious of coaptation. The important thing, none of this is actually telling you that there is cooperation. These are predictive parameters and uh, using multiple parameters would improve the predictive accuracy. And sometimes the predictive accuracy will be similar to that of an exit poll. You may get a totally different result and you may find that uh, if with a strong suspicion of cooptation, the in the neonatal period and in the infancy, you can exclude coarctation by serial examination. But the attempt is important. You are trying to predict a neonate which will crash with coarctation. Instead, you will find that um, uh, there is no coarctation, there is no harm. But trying to predict uh, is an important thing. So unlike other fetal diagnosis, coarctation is not an accurate diagnosis. It is a prediction. This shows uh, an example. This is a very good arch. This is the fetal uh, arch. Whereas here, the arch is small. It is here that we would suspect that there may be evolving coarctation. And a clinical approach to antenatally suspected coarctation. You are the neonatologist in charge. You are in day one. You have been told that the um, uh, fetal echocardiographer has said that uh, there is a possibility that this baby could have severe coarctation. How do you manage the baby? If the fetal diagnosis is firm, of course, you can see the lower limb pulses. If the pedal pulses are well felt, at that point, the baby has no coarctation. But it may not be evident until the duct closes. And so wait for the duct to close and um, be sure that you, you have prostaglandin ready. If the duct is closing and the lower limb pulse is decreasing, start, uh, start prostaglandin. And um, there is no clinically evident coact. Of course, you can, uh, if the suspicion had been raised, continue looking at the lower limb pulses in the blood pressure. And um, say by day five or so, if your cardiologist assures you that the arch looks normal, and more importantly, you are satisfied that the pedal pulses are normal, send the baby home. But six weeks later, repeat an echo. Remember, cooptation is a progressive disease. It is progressive because it is attributed to the constriction of ectopic ductal tissue, which is found in the isthmus. What happens if you don't do anything to children with coarctation? They simply don't leave children with coarctation without doing anything. They, you have to look at the natural history of the earlier days. Campbell's natural history study of the 50s and 60s is important, where we know that the average survival was only 35 years, and death occurs due to heart failure a rupture of the iota, endocarditis, or intracranial bleed. We do not want that to happen. Therefore, we want to do surgical repair of cooperation in the neonate itself. In a neonate, presence of congestive heart failure or an upper limb hypertension is an indication for cooperation. I want to put it in a different language. If a neonatologist feels that the lower limb pulses are not felt, in a cooptation, that is an indication for surgery because there would obviously be a gradient between upper limb and lower limb in such a setting. And uh, congestive heart failure, of course, is an indication, but then the, that is an evident indication. In the absence of heart failure, if there is clear cooptation in unit, that is an indication for surgery. And in older children and adults, upper limb hypertension is what Upper limb hypertension is defined as upper limb more than 20 millimeters compared to the lower limbs. Now, we will explain some of the techniques that I use. The, uh, I should acknowledge the uh, help of my former colleague, Professor Francois, uh, and Dr. John Willett for the images that I'm going to show. The first um, surgical repair was done by, by, done by resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis, craft food and nylon. In 1944. The concept of extended end to end anastomosis to address arch hypoplasia uh, is attributed to Professor Gerard Brown and a subclavian flap pyotoplasty, Val Dawson, the Swedish surgeon, a patch enlargement of the arch or iota, 
and for a proximal arch hypoplasia, anti-grade cerebral perfusion and repair under cardiopulmonary bypass, which is done today. Look at these images. If you are looking at a simple resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis, maybe this cartoon is more clear to you. This is the subclavian. Here is the uh, part distilled to the coagulation. The surgeon resects this match and then brings the descending aorta up and uh, produces an anastomosis. And that is a simple resection and end-to-end -end anastomosis. The extended end-to-end -end anastomosis does the same thing, but advances the proximal anastomosis to the undersurface of the arch and creates an oblique anastomosis, thereby trying to augment the distal transverse arch. This again, both like the previous one, is done from a left recording. When there is a proximal arch hypoplasia, some surgeons would still do it from the left thoracotomy, advance the descending aorta all the way to the curve of the, of the proximal transverse arch, creating an anastomosis there and thereby augmenting the proximal transverse arch. More often, surgeons would do it today from a median stenotomy under cardiopulmonary bypass. Sometimes, after augmenting the after doing a, a, an extended end to end anastomosis, the arch still is small, the anastomotic segment is still small. So the surgeon uses the subclavian artery, he sacrifices the subclavian artery, transects it, let the distal end go, ties it off, and the proximal end is used to enlarge the arch. With all these techniques, usually the results are excellent. And the arch, which was small, tends to grow with time. This is all for the neonate or the young infant. But if you're speaking of the older child, what do they do? How do they present to you? It may be by seeing hypertension in the young, uh, in the sense you're not dealing with a, an adult with hypertension. So you have a 10-year-old boy or a 20-year-old boy with hypertension. Coaptation should be kept in mind. Even in the Middle East, at the age of 40 or 50, when blood pressure is uncontrolled, you should always have secondary hypertension as a cause. And an important secondary hypertension cause is coagulation. And when there is aortic valve disease in the older child or adult, due to a bicuspid aortic valve, think of coagulation. In a patient who presents with intracranial hemorrhage or dissection, think of coagulation. An adult with claudication is an uncommon way presentation and an incidental detection patient came for something else somebody had the good sense to feel his low will impulses and coagulation is made out that's a very common way in which coagulation is picked up so in the older child and adult what do you look for in the general examination you can look for any syndromic features particularly of turner syndrome a feature that that is often noticed in an young adult is an upper limb muscles which are better developed than the lower limb muscles. The upper limb muscles look very uh, as if the person is an athlete, whereas the lower limb muscles are not tallying with that. Always look for a left thoracotomy or sternotomy scar because your patient might have had a unit of surgery and you are seeing him at the age of 25 years. On cardiovascular examination, look at the blood pressure and uh, both upper limbs and one lower limb at least. Upper limb hypertension is defined as the upper limb showing a blood pressure more than 20 millimeters of mercury compared to lower limbs. As I said earlier, whenever hypertension is difficult to control, you should think of coagulation as a possibility. The sine qua non of radiofemoral or brachiofemoral delay, feel the radial pulse and the femoral pulse at the same time. When the femoral pulse is delayed, that is radiofemoral delay, and that's a suggestion of coagulation. Quite often, your femoral pulses are not simply delayed, they are absent or very, very feebly felt. Sometimes, it is not only the femoral pulses, but the other pulses may behave differently. You may find that the femorals are weak, and the left radial is also weak, which means that the coagulation is involving the, the left subclavian, or as a bizarre finding, the left subclavian is okay, the left pulse is okay, but the right pulse is weak. 
This happens when there is an aberrant right subclavian, not an uncommon anomaly, which arises distal to the core from the descending aorta. And um, prominent suprasternal pulsations, because the ascending aorta is dilated, and visible or palpable collaterals. Uh, this is a CT angio image of one of our uh, patients which I have treated. What this shows is a prominent, this is the right internal mammary artery, this is the left internal mammary artery. As the internal mammary artery comes down, it divides into the superior epigastric and the inferior epigastric. The inferior epigastric is a branch uh, it, and of the ex uh, external iliac, the internal mammary divides into the superior epigastric and the musculofrenic. Of that, the superior epigastric will come and anastomose with the inferior epigastric, which is from the external area. So in an adult, if you make him stand up, you may find collaterals all the way in the abdomen. It is this uh, link between the superior epigastric from the internal mammary artery and the inferior epigastric from the iliac, which you are seeing. Turn him around, anastomosis around scapula. They subclavian branches to posterior intercostal. After all, the purpose of collaterals is to connect a pre coact artery to a post coact iota or branch. The X-ray, which I'll come to shortly, shows the internal mammary artery, uh, shows rib notching, and this happens because the internal mammary artery gives rise to the anterior intercostals, except in the first two spaces. This is linked with the posterior intercostal that comes from the descending aorta. It is the posterior intercostal which causes rib notching, the dilatation of the posterior intercostals. When you examine the patient, therefore, apart from hypertension, the prominent um, erotic pulsations, the apex beat tends to be forced uh, uh, heaving, left ventricular. There is a constant aortic ejection clip over the apex and the aortic area. Aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation may be there. There may be a brewy in the left interscapular region, which is actually the normal flow over the coax segment. Less commonly, there may be a continuous murmur over collaterals. In the test x ray, the characteristic grip notching would appear by five to six years. It's not in the neonate, slightly older child that you see rip notching because it takes some time to evolve. As I said, it's related to dilated posterior intercostals. The x ray may also show cardiomegaly, a dilated ascending aorta, and an inverted E sign. This is because the proximal part is a subclavian and proximal aorta, proximal descending aorta. Then the constriction of the coarctation and the post coarct dilatation that gives you a three sign or an inverted E sign. Remember, even though rip notching uh, is very characteristic, bilateral rip notching, typically seen in the three to seven ribs, is very characteristic of coarctation. Rip notching can also occur if something else is eroding the ribs. This may happen if there are very prominent collaterals like in an older child with tetralogy, or you may find unilateral rip notching after a BT shot. Uh, this is an X-ray which I have taken from in the net to highlight what is rib notching. Look at this lower border of the ribs. It is eroded in, in the sense that it is irregular and it is clear only. This is the feature of the typical rib notching. ECG shows LVH with uh, strain quite often, like you can see in this case, uh, V5A6 is showing ST depression. Echo, of course, is the diagnostic thing. In a suprasternal view, you can find a localized narrowing opposite the duct, which is the posterior shelf that we are speaking about. Hypoplasia of the isthmus and a variable portion of the arch. We have already referred to how we assess the arch. A postenotic dilatation could be seen. And if you're looking at the abdominal iota, you find that the pulsations are much less vigorous. They may not be pulsating at all. And in a continuous wave Doppler, you find a double envelope with a high flow velocity across the obstruction and a lower flow velocity proximal to the coarctation. And we speak of a diastolic tail, which I'll show you in a second, which is a sign of severe coarctation. 
And of course, in the heart, you look for associated lesions like bicuspidiotic valve, parachute mitral valve, LVOT obstruction, VSD, ductus, see whether there's an ASD. This is a still image of our cooperation. This is the shelf that we are speaking about. And in the Doppler, this is the, uh, the peak velocity that you will measure. But in diastole, ordinarily, there should be no, no Doppler signal. The fact that there is a Doppler signal means even in diastole, the descending aortic pressure is lower than the ascending aortic pressure. And therefore, you get the gradient. And that means severe cooperation. As I said, uh, you need an additional imaging sometimes. And the older the child, or if you're dealing with an adult, your echo becomes less and less reliable for a suprasternal view. And therefore, you need a CT or an MRI. Or if you're planning intervention, of course, you will do a cath and invasive angiography. This also you will see in the images to come. In the cath, you will see the, you know, of course, demonstrate the, the gradient by uh, in the cath, you will demonstrate the gradient between the ascending aorta and the descending aorta. A gradient more than 20 is significant. And you'll show an angio for the anatomy demonstration. So when you are managing coarctation in the older child or adult, surgery takes a backseat. Transcatheter management is preferred over surgery. If it's a smaller child, you do a balloon dilatation. In an older child or adult, you can stent. And uh, I will explain what is meant by a covered stent, which makes even tortuous coarcts in older adults manageable. So the three things that we do in a transcatheter management are balloon dilatation, primary stenting, and covered stent implantation. So look at this image. You have a three-year-old child, 17 kilograms. It's a discrete cooperation with a cat gradient of 40 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the angiogram shows the uh, injection is into the uh, arch, and you find the tight narrowing in the descending aorta. We need to assess this arch. We will make the measurements of the transverse arch, the part of the isthmus prior to the cooperation, the isthmus itself, and the distal uh, arch. We choose a balloon which is not bigger than one millimeter from the proximal segment. And when we do that, this is the sort of result that we get. You can see that that narrowing is gone. All that we have done is a balloon dilatation. So there's a good result here. On the other hand, here's a 25 year old male who was incidentally found to have a co-optation with a 30 millimeter upper limb lower limb gradient a continuous murmur, there was nothing wrong with his ECG. And the echo showed a coag gradient of 70. And um, he was on multiple drugs for his coagulation, related hypertension. And the cat showed a 40 millimeter gradient. And this was the CT angio. Incidentally, this shows the, the superiority of CT angio in an adult in demonstrating coagulation. You can see the high coagulation distal to uh, subclade. And uh, uh, I hope this image is clear enough to you. What it proposes to show is a tight coarctation and then a stent here, which has relieved the coarctation and abolished the gradient. The next case will show it even better. If you do just stenting, there's a risk of aneurysm formation. There is a remote chance of death and there is a small chance of neurologic damage. Therefore, there are instances when we want a better safeguard than a simple stent. And this is done by the covered stent. The covered stent is very much like a regular bare metal stent, but it is covered on the inside by a layer of uh, PTFE. It is covered by a layer of PTFE. The PTFE, Gortex being the trade name, the advantage is a very uh, compatible material with the circulation used for vascular grafts all over the body. So this PTFE is covering your stent. So when you are deploying the stent, the stent is actually you know, on the inside. Outside there is the PTFE. So even if there is a leak or if there is a localized rupture, it is as if you are putting a graft. So you have greater confidence in handling a doctor's co-opt in the older patient. The older the patient, the greater the risk of damage to the iota during stenting. 
And so in patients beyond the third decade or in those with a complex anatomy, a covered stent is elective. Look at this patient. This is a 43-year-old patient which I have seen in um, Chennai. She had cooptation, severe AR, and systemic hypertension. Amazingly, she had undergone an IoT-12 replacement 10 years ago with her cooptation missed. So she presented to me with severe aortic regurgitation on the prosthetic valve and severe hypertension on five drugs. And this was her angio. Sorry, you should see the CT angio. See that um, this 43-year-old lady has a very tortuous, tight co-op distal to the subclavian, and this is the angiogram. The angiogram shows a very tight, tortuous co -opt. We are using a balloon just to test the compliance of it. We are not thinking the balloon will yield the co -optation. And then the covered stent is being deployed. Just watch the stent. And then the in the final angio, the stent is in place. There is no narrowing there. And there is smooth flow. This lady, six months later, was just on beta blocker for her hypertension. Uh, I would also take a textbook case from uh, this book on uh, cases in adult congenital heart disease, where it, it's a 44-year-old man who has had a co-optation repair at three years of age, has presented with um, uh, upper limb blood pressure, right upper limb 18800, left upper limb 14000, right lower limb 120-90. So his um, left upper limb pulses are weaker, right lower limb is still weaker. And both echo and MRI show significant re co optation. He has already had a presence of a, had an episode of fatal relation, and he is on AC inhibitors in medical law. And this was his paddock uh, uh, MRI. You can see that the arch itself is severely stenotic, and uh, I will not bother you with the hemodynamics. The, but this arch was tended in this textbook case. And um, he has been adequately treated at the age of 43. In the older child and adult, often we are asked the question, is this a co-optation or is it a pseudo-co-optation? The question comes because in an image, the arch looks clean, but um, there is no gradient across that. So trying to distinguish co-optation versus pseudo-co-optation, in a co optation hypertension is invariable, whereas in pseudo co optation it may be associated but not a component of it. There is no ischemic narrowing in pseudo co optation, and therefore there is no pulse delay. And, and uh, the arch is elongated in pseudo co optation, so that's the reason why it is um, king, and there is no rip notching or collapse. So these are some of the the differences that help you to distinguish a co-optation from a pseudo co -optation in an older child or a child. re co -optation. I remember the textbook case that I showed you. I'm just giving another example that we have seen recently. A 15-year-old girl, the only child, a parent from Madurai, who had neonatal balloon aortic valve autonomy for severe aortic stenosis and surgical repair of co-optation a few months later. She had had recurrent co-optation has had balloon dilatation on multiple occasions. She had a hemiplegia at four, four years of age. Uh, the, there was a question of viral myocarditis superimposed on her basic problem. At 15 years, when we see her, her upper limb BP is 160 by 100 on the right side, 130 on the left side, while the lower limb is 80. And this was her cardiac MRI. You can see that the ascending aorta is OK, but the transverse arch is small, she has no subclavian, and her, she has a long isthmus, which is very small. And this shows her ventricle, this shows a, it is dilated and has reduced contraction. We uh, surgically treated that uh, lady and she, young girl, and she became all right. This actually highlights the importance of long term follow up of repair co optation. Not only those with residual problems. But even those who seem normal can have local vascular problems. They may develop restenosis or aneurysm. They can have ascending aortic dilatation. This is particularly uh, likely if there is a bicuspid aortic valve, but they tend to have a diffuse arterio for the, the abnormal structural changes in the ascending aorta. So when you are following a co-optation or bicuspid aortic valve patient, 
we specifically look for ascending aortic enlargement. And the other thing that we should know, even the most perfect repairs of arts in the neonate or young infant or adult or um, young child, when they reach their adulthood at the age of 40, they have a 50% chance of having essential hypertension. Since coarctation repairs are seldom that perfect, this contributes to the incidence of it. So if you are treating a coarctation child, then expect and advise them that it is important to keep checking the blood pressure regularly in adulthood and anticipate that hypertension could be there at 40 years. Aortic dissection is uncommon, but one should be aware of that. And uh, as they grow older, there's a risk of premature coronary artery disease, aortic valve disease, subaortic stenosis, mitral valve disease, very aneurysm, and polycystic kidney. Message operated children or intervened children with coagulation require lifelong follow up. And one particular problem I should say is pregnancy with coagulation. It may be a uh, previously undetected coagulation, or it may be a well-prepared coagulation. If you know that before a woman is planning uh, pregnancy, a preconception evaluation and counseling is required. There is a five to seven percent in the risk in the fetus. And in the woman, when you're evaluating, look for hypertension and image the site of repair and look for an aneurysm or residual coagulation. And the specific risks that the obstetrician and the cardiologist should be managing or should be looking for are hypertension, preeclampsia, and rarely dissection and rupture. It is more with a, uh, a dilated iota or a neurosome, and dilatation is more with a bicuspid aortic valve. And therefore, the pregnancy should be managed by a multidisciplinary team who can handle this. Meticulous blood pressure control, beta blockers are quite often used, and mont the ascending aortic size and aneurysm, if it is there, of course, you should be looking for it. And you may need serial MRI. You don't use gadolinium, which is um, teratogenic. And the delivery is cut short with uh, assisting in the second stage, not necessarily going for cesarean. And endocarditis prophylaxis is required. Thank you. So there's a lot of information on coagulation that you need to be aware of, which is relevant in the clinical management. So I'll be very happy to take your questions. Questions? Can I either ask them or uh, chat? Any questions? Yeah, is it is a question? Amrita, you should either relate to me or um, ask her to um, yeah. chat. The question? Can you please, all of you, please use the chat box for uh, asking questions? I think BCMCH, please use the chat box for asking questions. Or otherwise, you can unmute your uh, microphone and ask questions. Let, let that Please. not discourage you from asking questions. You're most welcome. The most <laughs> um, effective way to ask the question is the chat. SAT, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. We can use the chat box. 
The root of the location in the newborn period is palpation of both femoral sufficient. Uh, I would say, stamp a particular needle pulses. Feel the needle pulses very well. If you can feel the needle pulses very well, coarctation is unlike. Of course, you can feel the femorals. If the femorals are well felt, coarctation is very unlike. In fact, I always make the faith in the pediatrician's fingers, feeling or not feeling the pedal pulses in an NIDP reading. A number of things that can uh, influence NIDP reading and give you a reading. If your fingers show that the pulses are weak. Uh, that uh, posterior shelf, explain what is the posterior shelf. And in the echo, opposite the uh, in the posterior wall of the aorta, the normal coarctation anatomically is an infolding of the intima and media. So, in an image, this appears as a, as a projection, as a shelf in the posterior wall. So, that is the posterior shelf that we are referring to. Any other question? I think this is given enough time for the others to enter their questions by chat. Any other question? Clarification? Or if you are hearing any question, please leave to me. Any other question? Can we find anything for today? Sir. Yeah, if there are no questions, any other question? You have ten seconds to make a if this is the question. In the next ten seconds, I am winding up. So I think Amta, we can wait. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Thank you, Suresh, sir, Suresh sir, for the excellent presentation. So thank you all. And thank you, and thank you all for your active participation.